Hello, my name is Meg and today my topic of discussion will be the politics of dehumanisation in immigration, particularly in relation to refugees and asylum seekers. However, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm presenting on, the Wadjuk Noongar people. I wish to acknowledge their continuing connection to lands, waters and community and pay my respects to their culture, to elders both past, present and emerging. Now, there are a multitude of reasons that people migrate, and almost as many responses to immigration on a global level. The way that people talk and think about asylum seekers today is quite different to how refugees were viewed after the Second and First World Wars. Yet, is this shift because of political policies or perceptions that are held as the result of the way that they're portrayed in the media? My presentation argues that the discourse surrounding refugees and asylum seekers actually intertwines with the politics of nations and can't be separated. And we're specifically looking at Australia and the US as part of the global north. Now, while there are key instruments designed like the Refugee Convention to help people seeking asylum on an international level, states hide behind sovereignty and they use the media to dehumanize refugees and asylum seekers to revoke sympathy, encourage apathy and fear so that the borders can be secured and walls built. Immigration and the politics surrounding migration policies has become inseparable from how we view refugees and asylum seekers and how they're portrayed in the media. Now, the North-South Divide is an older concept from the 80s. It was first called the Brandt Line after the German Chancellor at the time. Now, while there is some debate about its relevance today, I mentioned this divide as it's been referenced by the World Bank in 2017 in relation to forced displacement and the Syrian refugee crisis, as well as by Newman in 2016 when he was discussing the responses to what is currently called the refugee crisis. Basically, the idea is that there is this divide between poor and rich nations, which can be illustrated by dividing the world into a richer global north versus the poorer global south. This divide illustrates a socio-economic and political divide. Um, and as you can see there by the countries listed, even if we don't use the terms global and north and south anymore, you can see that there's a trend here for what we consider Western countries, like the US and Australia to be considered part of the global north. Now, Betts once said in 2001 that outsiders can be perceived as a threat to the distinctiveness of the state's community and its ability to act as a unified collective. Today, we have leaders who respond to this idea by trying to project themselves as strong in the face of what they see as an external threat, which is asylum seekers. There have been many politicians in the US and Australia who have been guilty of this over the years. The most recent ones that easily spring to mind are people like Peter Dutton, Scott Morrison, Pauline Hanson, Donald Trump, and Mike Pence. Now, their answer is to represent asylum seekers traveling to their countries as a strain on resources for existing citizens. Or on the flip side, they like to portray them as Criminals, so murderers, pedophiles and rapists, terrorists, um, drug cartels, that kind of thing. Depending on which country you are, the crime changes. Now, the reality is actually that the global north deals with relatively small numbers of asylum seekers and refugees. So the images that you can see here sort of give you an overview. Um, the refugee crisis is actually impacting developing countries a lot more than countries like Australia, with the majority of the asylum seekers and refugees living in countries that actually neighbour their home states. So as you can see, in 2018, the UNHCR found that of the 25.4 million refugees in the world, 85% of those people were actually being hosted by only five countries. And those five countries are countries that the World Bank would consider to be less developed or part of the global south. So the top hosting countries, which are home to nearly 17 million refugees last year, are countries that you can see on the right hand side there, Turkey, Uganda, Pakistan, Lebanon and the Republic of Iran. Which is not at all how our politicians present it when they're discussing asylum seekers and the flood coming for us.
Which brings me to discourse and prejudice. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, the discourse surrounding refugees and asylum seekers intertwines with politics. It's inseparable. You can't find a news article about one that doesn't include the other. The labels that we give to displaced people, whether it be displaced, refugee or asylum seeker, or whether it be illegal, irregular, boat people, terrorist, rapist, murderer, like they all have an impact. Doesn't matter what you call them. So as Pisani, Gretsch and Mustafa said in 2016, these labels matter because they not only frame but uphold and reinforce the power relations that exist. When politicians and the media use these labels and divide displaced people into different categories, it actually makes it easier to forget that these are real people we're talking about. So people like Feruz Bushani and Hassali Shah Ahmed are people with real lived experiences and yet we don't see them. Politicians don't mention their names and neither does the media in most cases. So instead, politicians Politicians focus on dialogue around strengthening borders and building walls, with the goal being purely to keep people out. And the easiest way for them to maintain their momentum when they, they put policies in place to reinforce that is to trigger what Tafi Giam calls a state of panic over the phony threat that refugees pose to a nation's sovereignty. No. Whether or not the media agrees with politicians when they say this doesn't actually really matter that much um, in the sense that they're just as guilty of dehumanising the people who are, are seeking asylum. So here I've got some examples of media articles and all of the photos come from those articles. I tried to get one from each but ran out of space. <laughs> These were all released over the last 12 months in relation to asylum seekers and as you can see, not one of the images shown shows an individual asylum seeker with distinguishable features. When an individual is shown in these articles, it's always the politicians, they're always on their own and they're almost always shouting. Now, the first quote that you can see here is actually from the article titled Scott Morrison is banking on asylum seeker scare campaign that could backfire by Norman. The focus of this article was more on the way in which the Liberal Party portrays asylum seekers and it illustrates that point that I made earlier about political leaders trying to portray themselves as strong in the face of an external threat. So even though Norman does criticise their tactics, he doesn't humanise the people that he's talking about when he's referencing refugees and asylum seekers, they remain a faceless group. The only person with a face in this article is our little screaming scomo down in the right corner there. So that brings me to the quote by Bleeker et al. Um, from 2013. Now I believe this article makes the same point. Um, Bleeker wrote that the relative absence of images depicting individual asylum seekers with recognisable facial features associates refugees not with a humanitarian challenge, but instead with threats to sovereignty and security. So these dehumanizing visual patterns of showing us groups of refugees reinforce politics of fear. And that explains why asylum seekers and refugees are publicly framed as people whose plight, whilst dire, nevertheless fails to generate compassionate political responses. The failure to humanise asylum seekers and refugees, combined with consistent messaging from senior politicians in Australia and overseas, has meant that despite the inhumane treatment of people, for example, in Australia's offshore detention facilities, no real changes to the way that we treat them has really taken root in the last 20 years. So, Detention centres and the way that claims for asylum are processed is a big part of this. Um, I can't cover all of it, so I'm just going to sort of touch on it a little. The Human Rights Watch report, um, the World Report from 2019, found that many asylum seekers and refugees suffer complex health problems, including mental health conditions that have been exacerbated by long periods in detention and uncertainty about their futures. Australia has one of the worst reputations in the world for this, and Beirouz Bushani, who incidentally was a friend of the gentleman that you can see in the photo here, Faisal, um, has called this a systematic torture through neglect, um, which is systemic violence. 
Janet Phillips in 2015 said that there are no orderly queues for asylum seekers to join. Only a very small percentage of asylum seekers are actually registered with the UNHCR. And of those, about only 1% are recognised by the UNHCR as refugees who meet the resettlement criteria and are subsequently resettled to another country, for example, the US or Australia. Furthermore, the amount of time that it takes to complete a claim is ridiculous. You've got people like Behrouz Bishani who have been locked up for the last six years. Um, this means that the instruments that we have in place to protect refugee rights, like the Refugee Convention, for example, are actually limited in their application based on whether or not a state chooses to follow it to the letter or not. Um, and also whether or not a person meets the ever more convoluted criteria of what a refugee is because we have so many labels for them now. For those who come to Australia by boat seeking Australia's protection, they find that they're classified under Australian law to be unlawful non-citizens, even though they have the right under international law and the Refugee Convention to seek asylum and not be penalised for their mode of entry. Um, Phillips did an article on that called Asylum Seekers and Refugees, What Are the Facts? And that's actually in the parliamentary libraries. So it's not like the government can plead ignorance. They actually seem to be quite proud of it. Now, Kosravi and Tofgian have both pointed out that there is a tendency in Western countries like Australia and the US to approach immigration and refugee policies through the lens of capitalism and racially discriminatory thinking as a way of regulating who enters these states. Furthermore, you can actually see that there's a trend between both countries at present to close their borders to refugees and asylum seekers, between Australia's Operation Sovereign Borders and the wall that Trump would like to build between the US and Mexico, there's no shortage of media coverage or political discussion around how to end the refugee crisis and stop immigration altogether. The trend at the moment is to equate asylum seekers to criminals in both countries. So in America, um, sorry, in Australia, we have Scott Morrison's recent remarks on the need to protect Australians from murderers, rapists, and pedophiles that are hiding among legitimate refugees. And in the US, you have Trump and his America First policies working to make out that building a wall between the US and Mexico will prevent the flow of drugs, weapons, and people across their borders. Um, which they actually call criminal aliens in some of the articles that I looked at. As a result, current immigration policies reinforce the trend of racism and reform becomes more difficult because, as Gelber and MacDonald in 2006 point out, state sovereignty is used as a tool to maximise on the idea that governments are protecting the security of their citizens. And when the media relays the comments that these senior politicians make, people remember the terms used and not that there are real people behind them. So instead, asylum seekers become a threat, or at the very least, they become a thin veil, hiding between, sort of hiding violent criminals under their ranks, so to speak. Immigration and the politics surrounding migration policies has become inseparable from how refugees and asylum seekers are portrayed in the media. Even when the media has tried to criticise senior politicians for their immigration policies and racist attitudes and fear-mongering, they still fail to humanise the very people that they're supposedly arguing on behalf of. As a result, the discourse has inevitably become prejudiced against asylum seekers, which in turn means that there are no tangible steps taken to encourage the public to see asylum seekers like Faisal or Behrouz as individuals. As Udic said in 2018, immigrants as a group are frequently described in ways that portray them as less than human. This type of dehumanizing language and the lack of faces in photos leads to a negative emotional response and negative attitudes towards them. It's become clear that governments would prefer to encourage xenophobia over compassion, and I believe that if changes to the way the political discourse is held are to be effective, the media actually needs to show the people, not as piti pitiable, terrified groups, but as humans, individuals, or families that can be related to. I hope that you agree with this. Um, that is my presentation in a nutshell. Uh, here are my references, and thank you for your attention.